Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. If you noticed pink goo out this door at the bottom, or if you noticed multiple colors out in the parking lot, it is because there were what seemed like a million children celebrating and just screaming as loud as they could that God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We celebrated our last uh, days of jam for the year, for this year. Uh, and it was just wonderful. Uh, it just the way that it makes me feel to, to be here today uh, reminds me of when I was eight years old. And my mother and dad took me and my brother David to a little church up in the in the Black Hills in South Dakota called Canyon Lake Methodist Church. And I'll tell you, that was a day that changed my life. So don't, do not think that children coming to this place will not change their life because we've seen that transformation so many times, so many. And I, I still remember the very first Bible verse that I learned and it was, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that's what we tell them here. Come to this house of the worship where we can see that God is so good. So let's stand and let's celebrate his goodness this morning uh, with our first hymn. And there it is. Come thou almighty king. Come thou almighty king. Help us thy name to sing. Help us to praise, Father all-glorious, for all-victorious. Come and reign over us, Ancient of Days. Come thou in power and word, heard on thy mighty sword, our prayer of <coughs> Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness, on us descend. To the great one in three, eternal praises be. His Thy sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Amen. Amen. As we remain standing, let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to worship this morning. A, a couple of people missing. We are praying for Sid this morning as something in the air has him all worked up. So we're praying for him and continue praying for Miss Esther Lita for her surgery and, and her continued recovery. So we lift up all of those that are not able to join us in person today. But welcome those of you here and those on, online. We have Aftershock tonight, that's our youth group from uh, 5 to 6.30, that's our 6th through 8th grade. Tomorrow we have our brew crew from 8 to 10, so come for a great hot breakfast and some wonderful fellowship. Our Wednesday night Bible study starts the 3rd, which is this coming Wednesday. It's a study on Luke, and it is a phenomenal study. The Breakfast Club is already doing it, and they are loving it. So join us for that. It's an 8th session. It starts at 6 o'clock. We're done right at 7.30. Breakfast, I mean uh, dinner, not breakfast. Dinner is offered at that as well. Let's see. Community meal, that will be next Sunday. Uh, so we're going to be having that both in. You can eat in person downstairs or take it to go. 
the uh, summer camp. We have some summer kit camp coming along. We have quite a few kids, and so we're looking for some more scholarships. If you are interested in scholarshiping a child or want to donate to one of the fundraisers, um, we'll have some more information on that next week and exactly how many scholarships we need. Let's see. Prayer cards. Ms. Karen had new prayer cards printed up, so those are at the table. And so if you have a prayer request or if you have somebody come visit with you, those prayer cards and the membership cards or the sign-in cards are over there. The what? And some of the foyer as well. Very good. Brooklyn, you want to come up and collect change for change this morning? Y'all haven't been here to be able to do that. People are lugging their change around. So you can take one goal for change and another goal for offering because I'm not sure where your brother's at. you want to come pray with us and would you like to lead us in the Lord's Prayer? That would be great. I'm going to turn this microphone off for you, okay? Alright, let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day and for this beautiful opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, to lift our voices in song and prayer and to listen for a message that you will bring to us this morning. God, we pray for those that are not here, but really, truly would rather be nowhere else but here. God, we pray for their bodies to be healed. We pray for those that are traveling, to have traveling mercies. We pray for our brothers and sisters that are watching online. God, we just pray that you be with each and every one of us and touch each and every one of our lives today in a way that only you know we need to feel you. God, we pray that these offerings be multiplied to benefit your kingdom and the call you place on this body. And we pray that as givers come today, whether they place their, their monies in the change for change or in the offering plate, we pray, God, that you would bless them as cheerful givers. And, God, that you would over and beyond give back to them what they've given to you. We ask all of this as we join together and pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we use not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Him is the Spirit song. As the disciples were, were uh, 
in the room after Jesus died. They were in a dilemma, not unlike we are some days. Where, where is Jesus? Where is God on these days? But he is always with us. And this is such a beautiful prayer song. Because he wants to feed us more than anything. He wants us to believe and trust in him. So let's sing together. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you
So this is our third Sunday since the glorious Resurrection Day. Uh, but that first Easter did not seem so glorious if you think about it. Um, as you read the context of Luke 24, if you go back and read from the very first verse all the way to the end of, of Luke 24, you discover that it was a day characterized by fear and sadness and a whole lot of doubt. And so that's what we're going to look about today. Uh, we normally associate Easter with joy, but on this day, joy was not the emotion that people felt. So we're going to look. We, uh, we talked three weeks ago on that Easter Sunday about what Mary found in the tomb empty and how she, she ran back in the garden, how the gardener came, who she thought was the gardener, turned out to be Jesus. And he calls her by name, and that's when her, the scriptures are opened up to her and her eyes are open. And then we heard the next week about what happened on that Emmaus road. As those two, two Emmaus disciples were walking, and this stranger comes up to them, who they had no idea was Jesus. And then as he goes, and he gets to the house with them, and he breaks bread. And bread. again, the scriptures are open to him, and they see that it's Jesus then. And how those two disciples ran back to tell others as they were locked in the upper room. And so that's where we look today. This is where we are. This is that night, Easter night. While they were still talking about this, so they're talking about the two disciples have just told them Jesus appeared to them and broke bread with them. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do, you, do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, as we have walked this journey to Easter morning, and now we are we are just three weeks past that, God. We are going to look at these disciples on that same day. God, the emotions that they felt on that night and where Jesus was with them. God, we pray that you are with us today, that your presence is here, and that your word will come forth to us. We ask all of this in Christ Jesus' name. So remember I told y'all uh, on the, the road to Emmaus when we did it uh, that Peter, Peter uh, and those other 11 disciples sitting in that room as the two disciples from Emmaus come in. And then if I were there, I would have been like, this is great, this is good, but when do I get to see Jesus? When do I get to see the Lord? Uh, but one thing these appearances have shown us, both to Mary Magdalene in the garden and then um, on the road to Emmaus, and then as we'll see today behind locked doors, is that the resurrected Jesus meets us exactly where we are and exactly when we meet him. And so today we're going to look at what happened. So I want you to think of the experiences that the disciples had for three years walking with Jesus, serving with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. It was so clear to them that he was their Messiah. He was the Savior. He was, he was their Lord. What joy they had to experience day in and day out serving with him. And then what joy they had to experience the, the hope for deliverance when they received his power as they were walking with him those three years and they were able to heal and they were able to cast out demons and they were able to deliver people. And now, here they were. Here they were just those few days later after the crucified behind locked doors, so afraid, shell-shocked, in utter disbelief, desperate, their hope squashed. So consider this evidence that had been presented to them on that day. First, the eyewitness account of Mary Magdalene. Basically, they did not believe her at all. They didn't believe that the tomb was truly empty. Peter runs to look to make sure, right? And then the response that the disciples had with her words just seemed to be these, this 
idle tale. Then he appears to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. They come and they tell him all about it. But these disciples sitting in this room did not remember what Jesus had told them. They didn't remember that he said that he would have to be put to death. They didn't remember that he said he would come back three days later. They didn't believe the testimony of these two disciples that they entrusted this, this ministry to. They come and they tell him, not just did Mary tell him, not only did the other women tell him, but these, these two disciples come and tell him these people they should have trusted, the ones they knew so well, the ones they intimately knew in ministry, and they didn't believe them. Luke 24, 38 says, Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? I think that's a question we can all relate to. At some point in time, we all doubt. We all do. At some point in time, we all have troubled hearts. We all have doubts in our mind, either in our faith or about a circumstance or about a situation, wondering where God truly is. Other people find themselves gripped in fear. All we have to do is look around this world and we see people just gripped in fear. So the question before us today is one of life's most, most important questions, and it doesn't come from me. It comes from Jesus himself. Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? When Jesus first appeared, we're told the disciples were frightened. It says that their response was fear, complete fear. Jesus' appearance startled them. You think about the very last time they saw him. He was beaten to a bloody pulp. He had a crown of thorns on his head. He had holes through his hands, through his feet. He had a spear hole in his side. That was what they saw. They weren't prepared to see a fully bodied, embodied Christ healed and whole. They were not prepared. So they couldn't believe that Jesus could be there in that way. So they were afraid. Then there was the second reaction that it tells us in that scripture. That after Jesus showed him his hands and his feet, they still couldn't grasp it. Here's the way Eugene Peterson translates it in the message. He showed them his hands and feet. They still couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was just too much. It seemed too good to be true. So first there's fear, and then it's too good to be true. Jesus just can't win with these disciples on this day, can he? Fear, and then it's just too good to be true. But the Lord is determined, determined that they would believe. So his response to their fear and amazement was to accept where they were and gently guide them to the truth. There was no need to fear because Jesus came to show them. He was risen. He came to present the truth to them. It wasn't too good to be true. It was just good, amazing, wondrous, and he was standing there in their midst. So Jesus takes their unbelief, and he accepts them where they were, and he nurtured them into their faith, back into the faith he had taught them so deeply. He understood their hesitation, and he met it with sympathy and with the patience that only Jesus it really was an awesome event. Death defeated. I mean, no wonder they had difficulty with it, right? No wonder their limited minds couldn't get around what was happening, what they were seeing, what was going on. Jesus had predicted that it would happen, but I don't think they really understood what he meant that he would come back in three days. I mean, this cross was an awful and deadly and ugly thing, and death was final, at least until this moment. And the disciples had to take it all in, and Jesus gave them time. He gave them time to come to grips with reality. He gave them time to stand there and understand what truly happened and what it truly meant. Fear and amazement aren't really surprising reactions to this. They knew. They knew it was Jesus. But it says in amazement, they still didn't believe. It was almost like a shock and awe thing. But Jesus' response isn't, in, uh, isn't amazing either to me. It's not surprising because only pure love could respond that way. To truly lead them where they needed to be, this persistent understanding and nurturing to show them who he truly was. I don't think he expected them to just be nonchalant about him standing there in front of him. I think he met them in the midst of their human reaction, just like he does us. It's not the only time to see this happen when a disciple doubts. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to jump from Luke to John 20. Now, we heard Luke's interpretation of it. This is John's interpretation of it. In Luke, uh, John 20, verse 24, it says, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger in those marks and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So the other disciples had seen and talked to the Lord, and they relayed that to Thomas and, and talked about all the events of their meeting. And Thomas did not doubt that the other disciples saw him and that they had seen something, but they just he just couldn't quite grasp the reality of that experience. So Thomas had not regarded the fulfillment of the prophecies uh, or the words that, of Jesus that he would rise again uh, or that he considered the testimony of these other disciples. He had to see it for himself. I think it's interesting that Christ didn't appear to Thomas until after he'd appeared to all of the other ones. And then, almost like the story of leaving the 99 to go for the one, he goes and he seeks Thomas out. And he waits until he's right back with those disciples to show himself again. Verse 26 says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So this is the second appearance of Jesus to the disciples after his resurrection to all of them. The conditions were the same as the first time, except this time Thomas was there. Uh, there's very little doubt that this second appearance was solely for the benefit of doubting Thomas, and probably for us as well, because his response this time was to worship Jesus and to bear witness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Verse 27 says, And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. He knew exactly what Thomas had told those disciples. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus had every reason to leave Thomas in his unbelief. However, in his great love for Thomas and for all of humanity, Jesus says to him, do not believe. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Christ has nothing to hide, nothing to cover up, no issues to evade, nothing to put to the side or avoid. That invitation, do not disbelieve but believe, is to every believer. It's to every believer who doubts at some point, just as Thomas did. Jesus is saying, come investigate for yourself. Test the evidence. Touch me. And just like Thomas, be faithful, not faithless. Verse 28 says, Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. Now I want to tell you that that statement by Thomas is considered to be one of the greatest confessions in all of the New Testament. It is only one of ten times pro that proclaims Jesus as God. So fear can keep people from faith. We know that. It can keep people from, from the very thing in life that can offer them that greatest assurance and that greatest goodness. Uh, they can fear that they're not good enough. They can fear that they haven't ever done enough. They can fear that, that, that God doesn't know them or God doesn't love them or God isn't with them. They can, they can fear the thing that keeps them from getting to a deeper, deeper level of faith. So what is it that you fear today? Because we all fear something. We are humans, and it is human nature. But in the fear, just like with Thomas, just like with the disciples, just like with Mary, just like with the road to Emmaus, Jesus is always there. He knows us so very well, and he knows that he seeks to come after us, just like he did that one sheep. He seeks to knock down those obstacles that keep us from stepping just a little bit closer. So whatever it is, whether it's pride or doubt or guilt or shame or just whatever it is that holds us back, Jesus is here to knock down those obstacles of faith and stand among us. The disciples had deserted him, left him to die, ran and hid and locked herself in the upper room. And yet, in their fear, in walks their Savior and says, peace be with you. That's assurance for all of us that whatever we deal with, whatever holds us back, from a closer walk with God, that Christ says, let it go. I'm here. Grab on to me and I won't let go. Peace be with you. God invites us to come to him wherever we are in our brokenness or in our faith journey, in our doubts, in our pains, in our fear. God is merciful and delights in the fact that he can step down and come right in our midst. So peace be with you in your joy and in your struggle, in your certainty and in your doubt, in your love and your loss, in your happiness and in your sadness, in your fear and in your faith, in health and sickness life and death. God will be you wherever you are. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are wherever we are. We thank you, God, that you seek us out. And at times we are so much like Thomas. For we have to see to believe 
rather than believe without seeing. So God, we ask that we would be stronger when we leave here today. That we would believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you walk with us every single day. So God, you are with us no matter what the circumstance. You are with us no matter the outcome. That God, you are with us. Offering a peace that the world can never offer. You never said there wouldn't be struggles. And you never said there wouldn't be hard times. But you did say you would never leave us or forsake. So God, we cling to that promise today. And in the midst of hard circumstances, we pray we remember those words. For as the disciples forgot what you said, may we be a little bit stronger and remember that you are always with us. We ask that you be with those today that are having difficult times. That God, whatever their journey is and wherever their journey is taking them, that you would be with them and that they would feel your presence in a powerful way. God, strengthen us in all that we do and in all of our decisions. God, be with us as we listen for your voice to say, peace be with you. We ask all this in your son's precious name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Yes, let's stand on that promise as we sing this last uh, hymn and as we go out into the world this week, because God's promise is true, amen. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army ye shall Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is born in me. Stand. Stand upon those promises. Amen. I truly believe that the reason Jesus said to Thomas about believing without seeing is because he knew that the world would need to believe in the testimony of the disciples without seeing Jesus in physical form. So today, stand on that promise that God is with us no matter what. Go in peace today.